Hello, thanks for joining us on another episode of Talk Gnosis. As always, I'm your host, Deacon John, joined as always by my co-host, Jason Memel. Jason, how are you doing today, buddy? Hi, John. Good to talk to you today. Yeah, I'm really excited about our guest, which is what I always say. Like People are like, you're so obsequious to the guest. And I'm always like, today's my favorite scholar. But the thing is, I started this, or I should I should say I didn't start the show. I joined the show just so I'd have an excuse to talk to smart people, right? Because if I just call them on the phone, it freaks them out. Uh, so we have Dr. Todd McGowan. Uh, I never do bios either, but everybody should look up his work. So uh, he's a film studies professor. Uh, he is a writer, a podcaster. He, he writes about... Uh, society, Hegel, psychoanalysis, a lot of things, right, Dr. McGowan? Yeah. Right, uh, Todd, please. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you, Todd. Oh, wait, actually, Todd, you're, you're, you're roboting a bit. Can you? Really? Yeah. Is it, uh, should I take off these things? Yeah, maybe take them off. The, the mic might be going through there. I could also edit okay. around this, too, so. Okay. Okay, yeah, maybe turn them off, or, sorry about that. Okay, is that better? Oh, that's, that's perfect. perfect, that's perfect. Okay. Oh, that's Sorry, great. that was a problem. Oh, you know, I thought headphones would be better. Little did I know. Okay. Uh, anyways, I'll edit around that. Uh, and I'll also, you know, edit in things to make, my, make myself look smarter, better, what have you. Um, Let's so, maybe just do that introduction again. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, that would make my life easier. Okay, 131. And hello, and thanks for joining us on another episode of Talk Gnosis. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Stewart, joined as always by my co-host, Jason Memo. Jason, how are you doing today, buddy? Hi, John. Good to talk to you today. Uh, really excited about our guest today. It's uh, Dr. Todd McGowan. Uh, he is a film studies professor. He is a writer on psychoanalysis, on Hegel, on uh, this, this crazy world that we're in. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, people say I'm really obsequious to the guests, but I actually kind of started the show just so I could talk to smart people because if I just show up at their house or call them on the phone, it, it freaks them out. So, Todd, we're so happy to have you here. Great to be here. And, and you can actually call me or come up to my door anytime. I'd be happy to talk to you. Oh, <laughs> so. fantastic. Well, you know, I'm only a couple hours away, so you, you may regret saying Excellent. that. So, so, so the topic of the show is, is Hegelian Christianity. And, you know, on the show, we, we often do kind of look at, at sort of Christianity broadly. We look at biblical studies broadly. Uh, and we do look at, at Gnosticism in particular. And, uh, you know, I do see some similarities between Gnostic thought and uh, Hegel. I might just be reading it in, but uh, I, I think the audience uh, may or may not agree. But if they disagree, I think they're going to get a lot out of the show because I really think Hegelian Christianity uh, has uh, something to say to uh, a lot of people and to today's society. Todd, can you tell us uh, like a bit about Hegel? Like, just give us the Coles notes on him for people who aren't familiar. Yeah, so Hegel is a he's in this movement that's known as German idealism, and it's a movement that basically been, begins with Immanuel Kant writing the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781, and the the impact of that book really can't be exaggerated because it's it basically shifted the entire terrain of of thinking about the way that we start our philosophical questioning. And, and Kant's idea was we have to not think about how the how the world is, what things are, but first we have to think about uh, the nature of subjectivity and what it how we can possibly know what we know. And so that that really it's a movement that starts a bit with Rene Descartes in this uh, questioning like what can I be sure of this uh, skepticism that results in I think therefore I am, right? And Kant, and, and Kant says he pushes that a little further, a lot further, and then and then that idea that we have to look at subjectivity first becomes the the basis for philosophy. These and really a, a group of, I think, four really important philosophers. So Immanuel Kant, then Johann Gottlieb Fichte, and then uh, Friedrich Schilling, Schelling, and then Hegel. And so it's interesting. So Schelling is younger than Hegel, but kind of comes before him because he published his most important works before Hegel published his most important works. He's a, Schelling was a famous philosopher by the time he was 25. It's very interesting. So Hegel in, in 1807 writes this book called The Phenomenology of Spirit, in which he takes Kant as his point of departure and says, oh, what? let's look at how we know things and what can we be sure of by looking at how our subjectivity is structured. And then he goes through different 
ways in which we can imagine it being structured according to different historical epochs. So a lot of people say that Hegel introduced history into philosophy. And so he wrote two major books, Phenomenology of Spirit, 1807, and then 1812, 1813, a book called The Science of Logic, which Hegel says is about the understanding the mind of God before creation. <laughs> it sounds like it's kind of wacky and crazy, but it's actually not. It's, a, it's an attempt to think of the structure of logic and how logic works as a way to understand how the world is. And so you can see, if you think about it that way, you can see the Kantian, the way I just described Kant, the Kantian influence on that. So that's, and then, so Hegel lived till he died relatively early at 61, uh, 61 in 1831. And he had written, published two other books, Encyclopedia of, of the Sciences, and then the uh, Philosophy of Right, which is his book of political philosophy. And, and then these other books that Hegel's maybe more known for, like Philosophy of History or the Aesthetics, he never really published them as, didn't publish them as books at all, but they were collected from lecture notes of his students. So not even from his own lecture notes. So it's just interesting what's the the thing we most know about Hegel, mo most people, the philosophy of history is not even his book. So it's a it's a kind of interesting history that he has. But I, I for me, what's most important of him is he sees the way in which thought moves through contradiction. And I think that's there's a Christian element that we'll t I'm sure we'll talk about. But that's the to me that's the basic fundamental insight of his thinking, which he the name for it is dialectics. Right. Hmm. Right. And. So what first drew you to Hegel? Was it his beautiful prose? Did it, did it capture you? Jonathan, that's a nice, fun, <laughs> that's a funny, ironic statement. No, he's a terrible writer. Hegel's a terrible writer. <laughs> it's not just there's bad translations. He's just a, he's a straight up just terrible writer. And he even knew it. And he felt like this is, and, and, and there's a whole debate within studies on Hegel. Is it that the ideas Hegel's working with are just so difficult to communicate that that produces the bad writing, or is it he's just a bad writer? And I think it's a little <laughs> bit of both, but it's more he's just a bad writer. Uh, so it's not his writing. What first drew me to, to him was precisely this idea of, of dialectics and contradiction. And I came to Hegel through Marx initially, and I think that's how a lot of people come through. Like So Marx believed that he was doing it, what he called a materialist reversal of Hegel. So Hegel was very famously, I mentioned German idealism. He famously called himself an idealist and thought that contradictions were uh, evident on the realm of philosophy or ideas or stru ideational structures. And Marx thought, no, the contradictions are really economic and material, and that's what drives history. So there's, a, at least in Marx's mind, a fundamental quarrel about what drives history. But that's who I, how I came to him through Marx. And then I, I read when I was in graduate school, The Phenomenology of Spirit. And I just thought this is the most amazing book I've ever read. And I, I still feel that to this day. And I've taught it, I don't know, three times to students. And mm. and they, they, you know, they get a kick out of it, although it's not an easy read. It takes a whole semester to read. It's a kind of a, it's a slog. But I think they, they find it's a kind of, to me, a transformative experience to, to read it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have actually taken one of your, your seminars on the phenomenology, and you know, if you keep teaching them, I'll probably keep keep taking them because um, is with, with the phenomenology of spirit. Like, would you say part of its its readability, its difficulty is like the only way for him to explain it is to like go through it. Like, he has to like, you know, he has to work through it. It's it's almost like I, I don't want to say it's it, it's almost like a mythology. It's very not, but it's like he he has to go through the story. He has to go through what is actually happening in the book to explain the ideas. Yeah, Jonathan's a great way to put it. I think that uh, by the way, I still I can teach it infinite number of times because I still learn new things each time I go through it. So it's really it's a text that's really rich in that way. And I think, yeah, I think it's it's really important to paint the difficulty in, in the way that you did, because there's no, you can't, you really can't even, I mean, you can't give a summary. It's a book you cannot basically summarize, even though I've tried to, uh, it, because it, for the reason you say, like, there's no, you can't skip to the end. You can't skip through little things. Like, the whole point is work through a certain contradiction, a certain, that a position has internally within itself. So he's basically looking at all these different, you could call them theoretical, philosophical positions, or even social positions, political positions. And he's looking at them and saying, how do they, I'm going to follow out the internal logic of this position. 
and see where it leads. And he finds that it always leads to some kind of contradiction where it breaks down internally. And I think that's a really important thing that Hegel is changing philosophy away from Kant by not starting with a foundation and building on that, but instead taking just what's out there, what people already are arguing, what people, the theses they have, the assumptions they have, and saying, let's just take these positions seriously. Like, let's take skepticism seriously. Let's take cynicism seriously. Let's take take stoicism. A lot of people, I think, today are refinding stoicism because the world's horrible, and so they're like, okay, I'm going to turn inward. So let's just take that position seriously and see where it goes. And I think that's a, you know, it's a, it's a really compelling way to do uh, thinking, I and, and, and that compelled me, and I think that's. But that accounts for the difficulty, I think. Yeah, it, it does. Uh, yeah, it, 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 maybe the, the 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 summary might be the fact that you have to go through it, if that makes sense. Like, you, um, no, Jason, that's, that's exactly right. Right, you can't. You, the attempt to summarize it would miss the the, and I think this is the key thing with Hegel. It would miss. The, you might capture the content but you would miss the form. And I think what you're get alluding to, Jason, is the going through is experiencing the formal, the form of the argument, right? And so that mm -hmm. is his, I, I think he's the most formal philosopher of all, which makes his the difficulty of his prose ironic because he should have been a great writer because he's so interested in how the form really is the, you know, that famous Marshall McLuhan, the form, the medium is the message, right? Like the form mm -hmm. really is the message for, Hegel and I think he he pays attention to how the form has its own content, and mm -hmm. I think that's uh, you know he should have been a better writer for that reason alone. I think, but but yeah, I, I really like that idea that if you sum, if you summarized it, the summary would be you can't you have to go through it. You know, you have yeah. to yeah. The, the 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 grappling is the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely true. Yeah, and then, you know that that's why I say mythology because I I think the best mythology that the most uh, the what the, the kind that most illuminates the human condition, you know, the form is very important to the content. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, Christianity, like, is there such a thing as Hegelian Christianity? As in, does his thought contribute something to understanding Christianity that that wasn't there before Hegel? Is there is there a pre-Hegel Christianity and an after-Hegel Christianity? I think so. I think so, and I think he's the. I'm going to say something wildly hyperbolic. I think he's the most <laughs> important, he's the most important Christian thinker. I just think he is. I think he, because he, what he does is he 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 sees in Christianity, which I think is its real core. He sees the way in which it it takes away this idea of a God of the beyond, and it and he sees in Christ this bringing of God down to earth, which is of course what's what really happens, right? And so, not really, I mean, people get upset with me. Like, do you believe this? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, Hegel did believe it really happened, but I think it, regardless, the point is that the in the terms of the way God is figured, God is figured in Christianity as coming down to earth and then dying on the cross, right? And so that, that completely confounds any attempt to say, you can't say after Hegel, well, God only, you know, this famous like Beach Boys song, God only knows, right? Like you can't say that anymore. Like that, that, that in a way, Hegel's point is God doesn't know. Like God's just as in the dark about God's own processes as we are. And I think that's the notion of, that's the Christian idea. And he finds it, it's interesting because I think he, you could imagine, I mean, there are other notions of incarnation in Hinduism, say, and you, you could, and Hegel, he wasn't so acquainted with that, so, so that maybe is why, but but he does talk about it, and he does so, so single Christianity out, and for him, it's really the death of Christ on the cross, and the utter abasement that Christ's position within the society, this abased position, I think is really important to him, that, that the highest has to be identical with the lowest, and that's the in a certain way, that's the Hegelian dialectical matrix uh, understood in a nutshell, right? That the highest thing becomes, you see the way in which the highest contains the lowest in it, or is, is what Hegel would say, it's speculatively identical with that, with the lowest. And I think that's the, that's the key, the key idea for him. And I think that's for him, the emancipatory dimension of Christianity and the way in which Christianity has a politics to it. That's, that maybe 
wasn't so visible before Hegel. Although, you know, I mean, Kierkegaard hated him. So there's a way in which he, he that vision of Christianity really, really upset certain people uh, who, who, who would otherwise share, I think, some of his political ideas. So it's interesting about, about that. I mean, his relationship to Christianity, but I think he's I mean, part of what in my book, Emancipation After Hegel, that's one of the things that I want to say is that we should reclaim the Christian Hegel for emancipatory leftist politics. And because it's usually, there's this whole divide between Hegel's reception between right and left wing Hegelians, because he's so opaque that you can read him as a right winger, or you can read him as a left winger. I don't think successfully you can read him as a right winger, but uh, he was, and it was usually people that talked about him in terms of Christianity that were right-wing Hegelians, and it was left-wing Hegelians like Marx, for instance, Ludwig Feuerbach, who were really, really critical of the Christian dimension in Hegel's thought. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, too, um, actually talking about how you can read anything into Hegel, now, now some of our, our audience, you know, some of what you're talking about, like, they, they're probably getting some, some tingles, because there are some comparisons <laughs> to, to Gnosticism there, where you know, in Gnosticism, the, the wisdom of God tries to know God, but cannot. And then it, it mm -hmm. falls and contradiction and materiality starts in, in the myth. So, you know, in, in Gnosticism, God, God doesn't know and God has to work through the process to try to figure out what it is that, that God is and to try to know itself. And there's a very interesting um, uh, opening to, to one of the, the Gnostic texts where they kind of like, uh, uh, you know, you have the Neoplatonic, the one. But the, mm -hmm. the the text opens with the one cannot be known, right? And then the rest of the book is is the one trying to know itself. But it opens up with the one cannot be known. But it still mm -hmm. goes through the process. It goes through creation. It goes through us, right? It goes through these these waves of trying to know itself. And uh, you know, I it, it seems to be doing the pretty. You know, it's 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 kind of a rough go, if you ask me. If this is the process <laughs> that's going on right now, but but Todd. Uh, you know that, that that that's some comparisons and some things I see in there, but I'm scared because, like you said, with Hegel, can you read just about anything in in there? Can I make him say anything I want? Well, I mean, I think you can, but the question is, are you are you doing a violence to the text or not? And I think, like the right wing is, I think actually what you just described, I think does not do a violence to the text. I mean, I think that's pretty aligned with with what Hegel really thinks. I mean, I think that where he would be more distant is that he doesn't think. He, he, and, and there's a whole argument about this, but I, I think he thinks that there's this very famous line where it's, it comes from the phenomenology in the discussion of phrenology of all things, uh, where he says, spirit is a bone, right? And so he wants to insist upon the material basis of spirit in a way that I'm not sure that Gnosticism would accept. But I think that the, uh, everything else you said, I think seems to be in keeping with what Hegel thinks. So I, I think... Yeah, you can kind of have him say anything, but I think there's a, you could, you know, like with any text, you can do violence to it or you can, you can be in the spirit of it. And I think what you said seems really in the spirit of it to me. I think uh, I might need to back us up a little here just because I think there might be a, um, uh, a section where like a, my lack of knowledge on, on Hegel um, is doing a violence to my text <laughs> um, is, um, or just to my brain. Uh, when you were saying earlier, Todd, about, um, uh the like hegel as a like a, a, an incredibly important christian writer because of this perception of um of the of the like uh bringing the divine to earth in a way can you can you maybe dig a little bit deeper in there because i think maybe that's a bit where i i felt like there was a really interesting idea that we leapt past because i didn't have a, like you guys might already have that information but i don't yet yeah sure so he's basically saying i mean He's basically saying that there's a conception of God within Judaism, and he he sees Judaism as a advance on Greek paganism. But so so he sees there's a basic conception of God within Judaism as this unknowable beyond, right? So unknowable that you can't even write, like you can't even write God's name, you can't even speak God's actual name, right? So that's the that's the conception of God that, and, and Hegel sees that as an advance over certain ideas of God that of certain manifestations of God within, I don't know, plants or animals, whatever. Uh, but he thinks there's a limit to it because there's that God remains out of our 
hands. Like God remains totally foreign to us within this conception of mm -hmm. God. And so the, the great advance he thinks in Christianity is that all of a sudden that beyond becomes, you know, God is now walking among us. And I think for him, that's really, there's, there's, there's not really anything analogous to that, of that kind of disruption, because all of a sudden you can't, like, you can still pray, but in a way you're praying to yourself, right? Like you're, you're no longer praying to this being that's outside and, and manipulating things externally. Instead, God's within. And so it's a little bit, that's why there's a nice relationship between this and Hegel's philosophy, where he doesn't critique other thinkers from ex outside externally, but instead moves into the thought and finds the internal contradiction. So he sees, that's why I think Christianity is so important, not just Hegel for Christianity, but Christianity for Hegel. Like, I think he really, if it wasn't for Christianity, Hegel couldn't exist. And I think this is one of the points where he, this notion of like working through internally in a thought, I think that's, he gets that, that's something he gets from Christianity and this idea of God coming down to earth. And, and all of a sudden God is internal to human society. So that, that, that's what, he, that's what he means by that of God coming down, like God, like the highest coming down to the lowest, but also God becoming an internal being within, like the way people say commonly today, like, or maybe not so commonly, but God is within all of us. Like that idea, Hegel thinks is a nice Christian idea that, that, that bespeaks this bringing God down from the beyond. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was a, going back to like uh, Jonathan's sort of uh, Gnostic cosmology and does it connect with Hegel? I was like, I think I, I needed what you just said to give me a sense of like, to follow John's logic. Sure. If that makes sure. sense. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I actually deliberately uh, have kept Jason in the dark about Hegel. I'm like, don't read anything about Hegel. Don't listen to Todd's podcast. Cause I just wanted like pure on filter Jason. Right to see, <laughs> to see to get his insights about any contamination. So <laughs> it's really great, and that's the other thing too, because you know I have been immersing myself in this stuff. So uh, it's really great to to have uh, you know Jason there to to ground me, which is what I need generally in my life. Same thing with like narcissism, right? Like you know my <laughs> wife is is there to say this is so boring. Please shut the, the f up, um, and <laughs> that can that can you know pull me down to earth and allow me to be a normal person who can communicate with other people. Yeah. Um, well, and, and what's what's interesting here is that it, it sounds like like the kind of Christianity that Hegel is discussing is one in which getting down and like going through is the is again the kind of the point like not to not to only be in a um, in a conceptual space but to like that's right. That's right. practice it on the street kind of thing. That's right. That's for sure true. Right. For sure true. It's not right. He, like he was not. He. The, the, it's interesting. So if you read his philosophy of religion, which isn't again, is a series of lectures that he gave, not his own book, but he he has, n no one gets uh, more contempt from Hegel than monks, precisely for the reason that you said, like he think, he's, he'll even say, he uses the term he uses all the time, a monkish retreat from the world. He'll just use monkish as an adjective, a, a pejorative adjective, just to describe this person who retreats from the world and doesn't like go out and get their hands dirty. So mm. I think that's absolutely right. Like Christianity for him, means going out, getting your hands dirty. And it certainly doesn't mean I'm I'm putting a lot of chips in the bank for my future salvation, right? Like it's it's all about like this actual activity that the Which Christian. I, I, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off there. I was just going to say, but it, part of what I find again so interesting about this is that like one of the ways in which I often talk about Gnosticism and my own approach to it is that like, is that I like, I do love the, the, um, uh, the conceptualness of it, but then also at the same time, how do I use this when I'm stuck in traffic? Um, and that's, uh, so I think that I, I'm, yeah, I'm really engaged by this. I just felt yeah. like I wanted to yeah. make a, make a, put a pin in that. Yeah. Um, and uh, even, so though yeah Jason, John, even though Jason's in a Christian Gnostic church, he's, uh, he's not, he's not a big Jesus guy, he's not a big Christian guy. So <laughs> it, it's always, uh, you know, I'm not Jason, against it. <laughs> no, you're not against it, but I, I, you know, I, I know he's just not your number one, your number one man, right? That's that's Alan yeah. Moore. So, of uh, course, but, exactly. Yeah. But I, uh, 
They're, they're both bearded, you know. Yep. They have, they have a lot, a lot, in, a lot in common. But you know, I've always been a big JC, uh, uh, JC guy. Um, and uh, you know, there, there's been times when I, when I kind of gone up and down in, in my religious life and in my life, and oh, am I going to convert to Buddhism in, in my 20s or whatever, right? And and that that guy and uh, this, this kooky Christianity just keeps uh, calling me back. Um, now, now talking about some of the practicality, which which I think we'll get into possibly at the next question, Todd, I have to do a little song and dance because not literally. Um, which is, uh, we are sponsored by, by, uh, by a church. And so we, we can't agitate for, for, a, for a specific political party under the laws of the United States. And we also have a broad audience, and I want to have a broad audience. And we've, we have had more conservative guests. And if somebody wants to come on, like, please, you, you just email me. But I, I, we're really exploring things from, from a philosophical standpoint. You know, we're not agitating for a, 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 a particular political party, but I think regardless of your political beliefs, you would get a lot out of reading Hegel. Uh, if you hate Marxism, you should read Marx, right? If you despise it, you should really read it, like, you know, Jordan Peterson should have. Uh, and uh, <laughs> you're going to get a lot out of uh, a lot out of Todd's books. So, you know, I just have to do, do that little song and dance. And I think as well, sometimes, you know, when people hear right and left, they, they immediately think of specific political parties in whatever country they're in, right? And right. that's not necessarily what, what you're going to find in your books. And I think some people who sometimes think of the more cultural aspects of politics are, are quite surprised when they maybe engage with your work or engage with similar thinkers' work. Anyways, there's my song and dance. As per usual, if you have any complaints, it's Jason at GnosticWisdom.net. Um, Todd, the joke behind that is is that is, is I haven't set up that email yet. Um, so, <laughs> so the, the next can question. I can I just speak to that? Oh, please, I, please. I, I like that point a real a lot, and I I do think that I'll oftentimes use the term right and left to, to in a kind of general way, and I I definitely don't mean any certain political party, and and I think oftentimes maybe people that consider themselves right would see themselves in the image that I say about the left. So I don't think, I, and maybe it's not even a good, I mean, the, what I like about those terms is that they were invented just by t total random, like where people were seated. So yeah, I, I kind of, I think that's pretty good. And I, I sort of like that. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, I do, I do think that there, it's important to, I mean, I try to do this to, to speak to everyone. And I, I do think that Hegel's interesting because the book that I wrote on Hegel, I got, I didn't get any critiques from people that were conservative, maybe because they didn't read it, but I got a lot of critiques from people that were Marxist. So Hegel against Marx was, that's a real, that's a kind of a touchy issue. And so that's, I, I do, I do think that people that are conservative would find something, I mean, there's something valuable in Hegel, especially as a alternative to thinking about uh, society to Marxism. You know, so I think that there's, I think there's something to that. Yeah, yeah absolutely, hmm. absolutely. So, so Todd, so Hegel, he's he's a thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis guy, right? That, yeah, that's, well, what, <laughs> that's what dialectics is, right? Am I right on that? You just tried it. You're using trigger words for me. Isn't that what the kids <laughs> say? Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. There should be a trigger warning in it. Um, no, he, those terms never appear in his thought, and and one of the things that I do I don't know if this works or not, but the gambit of my book is to take this these this idea of thesis antithesis synthesis and show how it's precisely backwards and and work. It's almost like it works the opposite direction. Or what I do in the book is say each of these terms is 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 itself wrong. Like even thesis is wrong, antithesis is wrong, synthesis is wrong to in this description of Hegel's thought because the thought actually rather than moving first of all it doesn't begin with a thesis that's ex explicitly clear in hegel that he never art philosophy can't make argue you know can't argue from theses he just is very direct about that sorry i wasn't i wasn't pimping my book i didn't i shouldn't have made that and now you go, do go it, to buy it. it it's a great book so no, i guess <laughs> come on uh uh and then and then the and then the the the, the other point is that the, the antithesis for him if there was such a thing it's within the it's within the argument, right? It's not this external thing that's posed against. And then finally, nothing ever ends in a synthesis for Hegel. Everything ends in a contradiction, even the end of the book, absolute knowing, absolute idea. These are the two ending points of phenomenology, spirit, and science of logic. Those are points of all, the final contradiction, right? They're not points of synthesis. So th this idea that 
I mean, the idea most associated with Hegel is that history moves through thesis, antithesis, synthesis, totally, totally incorrect. So I, I think that it's that, yeah, thank God we have a chance to correct that because it's a real, it's the most, it's the thing he's most known for. And it's the thing that's most foreign to his thought. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and this is connected to dialectics, right? Is, is there anything that, you know, dialectics can, can show us about Christianity or Christianity can show us about dialectics or, or are they at all uh, connected? And I guess. Yeah. Which way would you are. put it? I mean, J Jonathan, I mean, would you put it that, I mean, I think I would say that dialectics came out of Christianity. Yeah. I think I would put it that way, but I think you could put it the other way, right? That, that dialectics gives itself is what gives birth to Christianity. So I, I think you could put it either way, but I think there's an intrinsic link between the two, just because of this idea of, again, because of, of the identity of God and, and, and human or the lowest and the highest. So I think that's a completely dialectical, I mean, that's the idea of dialectics that can you hold this contradictory idea, to, you know, within to, to yourself and not give it up. And I think that's the, I mean, what Kierkegaard, I just kind of sent Kierkegaard and Hegel, I suppose, but what Kierkegaard says is, is someone offended by the idea of the God man or, or are they not, right? And that's the, basically the idea of like, if you if you are offended, you're not Christian. And if you if you aren't offended, then you're Christian, right? So that's basically his idea. And I think that I, I think that's, I think that's right. Yeah. You know, there's uh, again, Jason, to uh, to to get you to get you down with JC. I know you are. I know you are. But uh, <laughs> I, I can't remember whose line this is. It's probably Zizek's. You know, let's say it's mine. Which is you know, Christianity is a technology for for people to do philosophy, and perhaps you know, I don't want to say simple people, right? But people who do not have time to to go to university, to uh, uh, who have to work, who you know, yada yada yada, right? For normal people to do philosophy, and and I think you know, contradiction and dialectics is is right there. There, right and you know the uh, Christianity is always making you think about contradiction well how can be how he how can he be both God and man at the same time right that doesn't make any sense well yeah well you're right yeah but it does um, kind of make sense and maybe that's everything well and, and like, let me sort of jump in here too is that like I'm, it's not the uh, I, I, I agree completely I think like that this is also I think uh, like a kind of almost a Joseph Campbellian approach of saying like uh, the myths allow us to think about things you know uh, stories allow us to think about things, and like religion as, is like as one of the the key stories is uh, and like in such a widely known story, I think as you say, allows people to think about complex things, but with, with a shared framework. Like, uh, tell one of my one of my big approaches is uh, what I call almost aesthetic Gnosticism, where I like I looking at um, religion and spirituality not as um, things that need to be true but whether or not they are sort of philosophically and emotionally useful you know um and uh so in that respect like yeah like i'm i'm totally on board with with jc <laughs> what i think i get just a little less on board with is like the somewhat dodgy 2000 years of various imperial history that's also associated with it you know <laughs> yeah that's interesting i mean uh I, so just first of all, to, to Jonathan's point, like I think that it is, this is Hegel's idea that, about religion. This is why he takes it seriously, because he thinks that religion is how ordinary people philosophize. And he thinks mm -hmm. like nobody has that. He, he thinks ordinary people don't have that. He's, he's, a, he's, I think, one of the least condescending thinkers, because his point is not that, oh, philosophers have that. He's like, no, no, no. Ordinary people are thinking the same things when they go through religious practices. They just don't have the time, the leisure time to think about these things in, in terms of like elaborate arguments and, mm -hmm. and discussions. And so religion gives you a way to philosophize on the cheap, say. And I mean, it's interesting because Hegel, uh, Hegel uh, Freud thought the same thing about jokes and psychoanalysis. So for Freud, jokes were the way that ordinary people do psychoanalysis and they, without even I mean, he thought everyone should go to psychoanalysis, I think, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, in the everyday way, this is the way you're doing what happens in psychoanalysis. For Hegel, same thing about religion, not just Christianity, any religion. He thought that the religion was the way in which the society thought about what was transcendent. And I think that's, I think that's pretty great. And I, so, I, so I think that's really, that's the idea you know that's that's why Hegel's occupied with religion. That's the why Christianity is important. And I do think that it that it, you know you know the imperial history. I think for Hegel that's a 
And I think that, you know, this is, it's often true that the greatest insights occasion the greatest betrayals. I mean, it's true mm. for Marx, right? It's true for, it seemed obviously true for Marx. The Oof, great yeah. insight into the way that capitalism functions ends up creating this Stalinist nightmare. And then, you know, this great Christian idea. It's, I mean, it's utterly clear that Christ was on the side of the, the disenfranchised and the impoverished. And so the how that could become the state religion of imperial Rome and then the of the Catholic Church. That, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible betrayal of the thought itself. But again, I think it's because of the maybe the radicality of the original insight that the, the, the depth of the betrayal is so extreme. That is a that is an idea bomb right there. That was great. <laughs> that was a, that's amazing. Um, sorry, John, you go ahead. I yeah, I, I, I'm cogitating over here. Yeah, yeah, and, and Todd, a, a big question. You wrote an entire book about it, but like how how emancipation, maybe emancipation in Hegel, maybe emancipation in Hegel and Christianity. How 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 can Hegel perhaps uh, point the way, you know, towards emancipation? Well, I think the key is that that, and this is the difference between Hegel and Marx, and I think between popular conceptions of Christianity and Hegel Hegelian Christianity is that. It's never for Hegel about overcoming contradiction. And I think a lot of people have an image of heaven as this place where I go where I'll no longer suffer from contradiction. And for Hegel, suffering from contradiction, contradiction could just mean, I mean, you can experience a lot of ways. You can experience it in terms of physical illness. You can experience it in terms of like, I, I'm not getting along with other people. Or you can experience it just in, I think uh, people say I'm having a mental health, you know, like that's contradiction, right? Like that, all those things. Our experience of contradiction. And I think one of the ideas of, of Marxism, maybe not Marx, is that, that we will attain a position, a kind of social order where a contradiction will be overcome, right? And so society, life will be better. I was talking to this activist, Astra Taylor, who's really great. And she said to me, she's like, no, once we, when we get a socialist society, everybody's has enough to eat. She goes, then things will be far worse for us psychically. And I think, I think that was a nice Hegelian insight that, that actually scarcity, there's something like the, if you look at the difference between scarcity and plenitude or scarcity and abundance, it's clear that scarcity is psychically much easier to deal with than abundance, right? That's why, you know, I was, I, one of my doctor, a doctor that I had once, uh, had, had worked in a really rich neighborhood. And he said, you wouldn't believe this, but the number of antidepressants I prescribed then, and then now that he was working in rural Vermont, was like 10 times the amount. So wow. same number of patients, 10 times the amount of antidepressants. So, okay, it could just be that they could afford it easier or whatever, but I don't think so. I think that there's really a nice insight that abundance actually brings out these psychic contradictions even more. And I think that's a nice Hegelian insight contra say typical Christianity or Marx, right? Like for typical Christianity abundance is we're going to, I'm going to enter into this state of pure plenitude or well, world or whatever it is. And I think like just as, as proof in the pudding there, like in, in North America, we've got probably some of the highest standards of living in the, in, in the world and like possibly so far in history. And, and like, and I'm not, not saying that people aren't, hungry and uh, unemployed, et cetera. But, uh, and yet the idea of scarcity is kind of what dr has driven so much of the political dialogue. Right. Um, yeah. uh, and, like, and yet we're standing at the top of this, uh, at least resource level of, of wealth. Right, right. Yeah. You know, I, I don't mean to, to pick on Jason. It's good that he has very different opinions from me because, again, it would be a very boring show if he didn't. And, of course, he has many <laughs> similar opinions, which also means that it would be a very boring show if he didn't. But, uh, you know, Jason and I have talked a lot about Stoicism, and uh, he, he's quite fond of the Stoics. And, and I, I and maybe maybe you can correct me, Todd, but but I think some people kind of interpret your work, you know, they – you, you know, this, this living of contradiction or, you know, we were talking to Helen Rollins, this, this, this living with the lack, it's, it's a kind of stoicism, living with what, what you can't have. Um, and, and I think that's how some people interpret, you know, some of your work. Is that, is that a correct interpretation? Yeah, I think that's about the worst interpretation I can imagine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, I would be a bad Hegelian if I was a stoic, right? Like, I think that because for, for the idea of living with lack or living with contradiction doesn't mean that you aren't 
striving like it is that no instead it's the that's the basis of striving the basis for engaging in the world like just because i think it's a weird idea that if you think if i can't overcome contradiction i'll stop struggling altogether i think that that's i mean think about the way i play tennis right and i i i know that i'm never going to be a perfect tennis player but that doesn't stop me from struggling that like that 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 drives me to struggle further and and to try to get better and i don't and 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 the more i fail the more i try i strive right like it's not like uh it's not like the failure, the, the inevitability of the failure is a barrier to the striving. I think it's actually more the other way around. I think that stoicism, sorry, Jason, I think it wants to preserve a kind of a pure utopian point of, of harmony that it, that, it, you know, it'll never, it'll never reach, right? And so that, that, so if you just, if you can't reach it, then I'm not even going to strive for it, right? And so that's the, I don't know. So I don't think that at all. Like, I think that like living with the lack or however you want to put it, like to me, that's more of a, that's a thing that drives you to act, not a thing that is a retreat from action or the world. Um, I uh, I think the, the one thing I would say there is that there is, uh, I think a lot of contemporary and like modern uh, people who are proponents of stoicism, um, uh, with the exception of maybe Donald Robertson, who's actually got a pretty healthy view, um, the idea of stoicism as a retreat um, and as like sort of a, a placidity is I think um, not uh, not the fullest picture of a, of a stoic approach. Like uh, if anything, I would say stoic, a stoic approach might be an ability to engage with and acknowledge the lack and say, yes, that lack is there. How do I then engage with my community, with my family, with my life um, as, as healthily as possible? Um, like if anything, I would say actually a stoic approach would, 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 uh, uh, would want to find that lack and say that lack exists. Right. But if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah that not, makes not sense. Not but does stoic, like, I think that stoicism is like, I get your point about not retreating from, and I think that's a really good point. Like is not really a retreat from the world, but it is a sort of acceptance of, uh, that the real world is within, right? Like, isn't that the isn't that the stoical idea? Like, the real world is within, and so I'm going to turn inward rather than finding it something outward. Well, like, I mean, there's the, uh, not unlike Gnosticism. There's like a um, sort of a lot whole, a whole lot of flavors of stoicism. Yeah. Like uh, the and like there's classic stoicism. There's like modern approaches to it. I think like the the ways the, the um, without speaking maybe as a scholar of stoicism and actually we might be getting Donald Robertson on the show and so he'll maybe he'll, he'll correct me on this later um, but uh, uh, it's the 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 the, the um, some of the, the main focuses of stoicism is, are essentially acknowledging uh, that like that things are going to like change that you're going to go through loss you're going to go through uh, problems etc um, and rather than than confronting those experiences as though you feel they should not have happened, um, because they because in a say for example like a, in a religious sense that like I'm a good person therefore good things should happen to me, you know like a stoic approach would be like no things are just going to happen whether or not like so you you might as well be as prepared as possible for for uh, for life in all of its forms to happen. Um, rather than judging it like uh, it, according to how you thought it should have gone, right? Sorry, no, I, I get that. yeah, I guess I, I, <laughs> no, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I and, and I think there's a it's interesting. I mean, I think one could make the argument. I'm not sure this would be my argument that Hegel dislikes Stoicism to such an extent, which I think he does because of this maybe proximity to it, right? Like a mm -hmm. there, because what you like based on what you said, I don't really have that much of a quarrel with that, right? Like that seems like that's pretty good. Uh, I guess the only thing would be this, like, where do you like, like this sense of like, uh, I guess what what Hegel has a beef about, and 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 again, maybe this is something that is not really he's just wrong in his reading of Stoicism, mm. is that 
it 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 doesn't find its content out in the world that it engages with, but rather internally, right? And but yet it can't it doesn't develop that content on its own. Like and just the mm -hmm. way you you said that, like events in life happen. Like Hegel just wouldn't say that. Like he would just say, well, things happen. like like I think Rousseau says this about the earthquake at Lisbon, right? Like, okay, it was a natural disaster, right? Ever it, it was. Mm -hmm. But if we hadn't built buildings that were four, three, four stories high, maybe no one would have died, right? So, so it's not just a natural disaster. This is Rousseau's point. I think it's Rousseau's. Mm -hmm. point. Uh, it's a, it's also our disaster, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, to me, when you say bad things are going to happen, I think Stoicism doesn't acknowledge enough the way in which it's our structures. Like, of course, certain bad things are going to happen. Like, certain we're going to age and die. Mm -hmm. That's definitely true. Not me. Uh, but, like, the way <laughs> that we age and die, like it, it, like lung cancer, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. not, that doesn't just happen. That's a oh, happen sure. Yeah. Right? And so that's, I think that would be Hegel's, and, and, and lung cancer is maybe too individualistic an example, mm -hmm. right? Like, like more like people that develop cancer through asbestos or whatever, <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe like, something like Alzheimer's, maybe it's linked to the aluminum all that we are, the plastics that we, who knows, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I think that's, well, and that would be yeah. Hegel's point, right? His point totally. would be like, let's look in way, the way in which there aren't just these things happening, but we're actually, this, our structure is making these things happen. Yeah. And like a, a, a lot of the classic Stoics like also believed in uh, like um, uh, civic engagement and family engagement as like, important important values so that like if you're going to take time to kind of rationally think through your responses to things then like what do you do next and that what you do next is often like taking care of your family taking care of your community kind of going out in those ways uh it is i would say compared to hegel compared to a lot of philosophies relatively limited like it is not actually trying to um to answer all questions, <laughs> it is kind of a it is a very internal process, and in that respect too, like I would say, like I think like nothing none of what I'm hearing would contravene my Stoic approaches, so that I could be like a Stoic Hegelian, if that makes sense, which H Hegel might hate. <laughs> yeah, he would not like that because <laughs> but see, even the way Jason, I think even the way you put it, he wouldn't like, right? Like he wouldn't like that. There's this internal thing and then i i decide like the thing you said like i i family's important civic duty is important so i'm going to decide to intervene he would not accept that he would say no sorry you're intervening already in these things even though you might not know it so like there's not for for hegel there's not this firm divide between the internal and the external instead mm -hmm. he thinks the internal always expresses itself and the external always impacts the internal so it it works i mean that's the idea of dialectics that it works both ways right like it like whatever you have inside you're expressing it whether i mean it's a, it's, a, it's almost a nice psychoanalytic point through gesture through mm -hmm. slips through whatever you're expressing what is this internal secret that you have there's not this private realm within that you can keep away from the world and vice versa the external world is impacting you so you you can't just dis you can't think about it and think I should intervene. No, sorry, you for Hegel, you're already intervening. So I think that that that's why I think it would be impossible to be a Stoic Hegelian. Like I do, I think because he would not accept <laughs> that there's a limited philosophy, right? Like you just said, the very thing that you just said, it's a very limited. He would say, no, it's not. That's not at all. It may think it's a limited philosophy, but even you can't. He doesn't think you can carve out your own limits like that. Right? Like this is his famous yeah. critique of Immanuel Kant. So Kant thought yeah. we have to limit philosophy so that we don't run into all these errors. Right? He thought philosophy right. runs into these what he called antinomies if it tries to think too far. So and let, let me. Like, sorry, just one, sorry. Go yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, finish your no, thought. Yeah. Quickly. He, and so he goes like, no, no, no. Once you establish a limit, you're already beyond the limit because you're establishing, you're making the limit. Right. So so that so he doesn't think you can have just a nice little local philosophy. Totally. And when I say local or, or limited, I think I, I mean more like uh, into, that it's its focus or its its application is 
in the sense of like uh, like starting from the perspective of of the thinker of the the person operating. Um, and so let me let me try this this idea here is that if if Hegel's like if the synopsis of Hegel is the idea of going through, of grappling with uh, the contradictions. Uh, again, hold on to your hold on to your uh, your Hegel's here. I would say that's a stoic approach, like because the 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 core application that I find value in in terms of stoicism is is encountering just about anything and then grappling with it, doing your best to uncouple uh, any automatic judgments you're making about it, any any assumptions, and and it really truly investigating everything that you come across and trying to to fully grapple with it as as clearly as you possibly can. Um, and that the like uh, like so in, in that respect, when I say it, like it's limited, I think in the sense that stoicism doesn't doesn't give you like 10 commandments to go forward with. It's it's like like here's just your checklist that you apply to all possible situations. It's like what like what is this thing in front of you right now? What are, what assumptions are you making about it? Try to engage with those as as clearly as you possibly can. And I think maybe the there is a possibility there of like stoicism assuming that there's a thing to be looking, you know, like uh, there's a there's a quiet place in which you can look from. I don't know if that's uh, maybe th maybe he would be against that, but like, but yeah, like uh, uh, what I what I find useful about stoicism is that it allows for the grappling. Like it's grappling is the point of it. Yeah, that seems good to me. I mean, I do think that the, the, though there is a kind of assumption lurking behind, not even just the quiet place, although that reminds me of the film Get Out, um, <laughs> but, but <laughs> which you don't want to be there. Uh, <laughs> Which, but it's like the the way the divide between. I think this gets back to the question of what I was saying earlier. Like the divide between, like there's a certain idea of subjectivity already implicit that maybe needs to be interrogated or worked sure. out. Yeah, that's all I would say. But yeah, I don't have. I mean, in terms of the grappling and working, to like uh, trying to abandon your assumptions and enter into a thing. Sure, I think that seems perfectly good, and 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 that may be a point at which. Stoicism and Hegel overlap, although again, he would not it's rolling like, his grave. He 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 has a great one of his <laughs> one of his funniest jokes, actually. He has a lot of he's a very funny thinker. Uh even though he's a hard bad writer, it's a it's a very odd uh combination. But he, he has this funny joke when he, he talking about the founder of Stoicism, Chrysippus, and he says, you know, not much is left of his work, and he, and he they're just these fragments, and he goes, But you know, if given the choice between having none of his work at all and having all of it, it would be a tough call. That's what he said. He's <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny, but, he, but it, like that kind of derision, he would never, it's only a stoic that would get that. So it's kind of, yeah, yeah. maybe maybe you can have a whole psychoanalysis of Hegel and his relationship to stoicism because of kind of what you're saying, this way in which inhabiting the position internally is already a stoical approach to things, right? So I think that's, mm -hmm. That seems like fair game to me, actually, to to psychoanalyze Hegel's why is it always stoicism and you know the monkish like he's kind of maybe he's too monkish himself or he's that's his repressed or something. So I think I do think there's that's fair game. Yeah, they called him the, the old man at, at university, right? So he that is did correct. seem to right. kind of have a, a monkish air about him. So perhaps a, perhaps there is something going on there. I, to, I feel like there's maybe like a Jungian shadow vibe we could we could throw in here. <laughs> but <laughs> that's well, how so? well, I'm I'm completely ballparking here. Just that like uh Jung talks often talks about how the your your shadow shows up in your in in your like sort of oppositions to things. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, I think that's absolutely. I mean, that's a good for for I thought that too. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Good psychoanalytic point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to to bring it back to Gnosticism and, and some more comparisons I, I, I see with Hegel. Uh, the ancient Gnostics were well reputed as viewing themselves as cosmically alienated. And the, you can interpret the text that they want people to feel alienated. Uh, Todd, what does Hegel say about alienation? And, and isn't alienation a bad thing? Isn't that what's the, the main problem with the world right now? Yeah, you know, it's uh, 
John, that's so great that you brought that up. I'm actually, right before I got on with you, I was working on my book about alien, it's, it's something like how alienation is so great or something like that. I mean, that's not <laughs> that'd be a bad title, but uh, yeah, that's the, that, that's, that's Hegel's idea. He's the first thinker, I think, and, the, and, and maybe the last because nobody, I mean, nobody really has taken this up uh, to think that alienation is really a positive thing for, for Hegel, alienation and being alienated is what allows us to, maybe he's not the first thinker to think this, because as you just pointed out, the Gnostics thought it first, uh, that, that, that alienation is what uh, makes us who we are. And so that if we try to imagine a world prior to alienation, or we try to overcome our alienation, that would be disaster. That would be nightmare. So, so he's, and, and it's interesting because Marx, at least early on, so 1844 manuscripts, Marx talks about bourgeois society as being alienating, and that's the problem with it. And it alienates the worker from the product of the of the labor, and that and that communism would be the overcoming of this alienation. Hegel is dead. Okay, in the later Marx, the term alienation totally disappears. So, and the, the term is Marx uses two terms: entfremdung in German or entwisserung. So, one of those, and Hegel uses both terms both as well, and they both. They're, they're related, but both of them are about this the distancing from oneself or alienation or estrangement from oneself. And I think that for Hegel, it's only when we do that, that we find ourselves. So it's only when we're alien to ourselves that that we get a sense of that's who we are. And, we, and, and it's only through that alienation that we can even reflect on ourselves at all. So we should not be trying to overcome it. We should be thankful that we are alienated. Yeah. Uh, another question. Oops, uh, another question that uh, is uh, suspiciously leading, but I think it's, it's quite relevant. So uh, a lot of people come uh, to religion for belonging. Right. And uh, even people who are who are critics of religion, you know, we, we live in, uh, quote unquote, a secular society. I'd argue we actually live in a very religious society, but yet we, we pretend it's a secular society. And, and even critics of religion say, well, you know, one of the problems that we have now is, is that that people have no sense of belonging. And, you know, religion used to create belonging. And now that it's gone, we have this problem. You know, what might be some issues with this search for belonging? Yeah, do you know this book, uh, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam? It's an yep. exact articulation of what you're saying. I think Hegel would like that we are bowling alone. I think Hegel thinks belonging is the problem and that it, 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 part of the reason why belonging is a problem is that the, our non-belonging is intractable, right? Like you cannot, if you're trying to belong, you're always going to be trying to belong and you're never going to feel like you really belong. And his great expression of this comes in his most, unfortunately, famous passage of the, the dialectic of the master and the servant. And, and I think it's a nice expression of the impossibility of belonging because the master wants to know that the master is a master. And so the master needs recognition from the servant that, oh, you really are someone. You're really, a, you're really important. You belong, right? But the, the, the recognition only comes from someone who's submitted to the master. Another master is never going to recognize the master because another master is going to say, no, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, have to have a fight to determine who's the real master. And so there's no possible belonging. And this is Hegel's idea that the one who recognizes us as belonging, which is what we're striving for, if we're invested in belonging, is never going to be worthy to invest themselves in us because they are doing so right so so and this is true if you've ever gotten any kind of recognition in your life you quickly find out you're quick you quickly discover well that recognition from that person that doesn't really mean that much which is why i don't know if you feel this way but if you get comments from you don't know who they're from they're always more meaningful than like once you find out who the person is you're like oh okay well that was just a graduate student or that was just, you know, like I got a, I got a really nice email from somebody that's pretty well known about one of my, actually about my book on Hegel. And I I was like, oh, that's nice. But then I, of course, realized I, because I've read Hegel, I was like, ah, oh, recognition, whatever. I said, <laughs> this must be not quite what I thought because they bothered to email me and thought my book was pretty good. So oh, the, moment, the moment that you get the recognition that you belong, 
it's oh, you realize that the source giving it to you is is inadequate in some way. So I think that that's that's Hegel's told that's his claim on belonging. So he would say, no, you have to instead realize that our non-belonging is universal. That's what's universal for Hegel. It's a universal non-belonging, and I think that's the that's one of his most important political insights, because I think that it, it, as long as we're invested in this idea of belonging or inclusivity, I think same thing. As long as we're, you're never going to feel included enough because the people telling you you're included aren't the people you want to tell. And I so, think, yeah, go ahead. Uh, th this might be like a, a first year student question, but like, is, is not that statement also kind of like a, a bit of a paradox? Because like, uh, to suggest that we essentially all belong to complete alienation <laughs> is like to, it's still like you're still drawing a circle around something. No, I don't think so because the, the, the circle still exists. Like there's still a circle of belonging. It's just mm -hmm. everyone is out of it. So I don't <laughs> think it's the same thing. I don't think it's the same thing at all. Like I think okay. there really is an empty set of belonging and no one is in it. So I think it's different to say, okay. like, I think it, I, and what you're suggesting is that universal, a positive universal is the same thing as this negative universal universality of non-belonging. I don't think it is. I think there's a difference between saying like we all belong or no one, be to say no one belongs. I think it's a radically different statement because you, there's a difference between striving to belong and mm. accepting one's non-belonging. I think there's a big difference between those two things. Sure. Yeah. And I like I'm not exactly not holding that position so much as I'm engaging. Like sure. you're generating sure. questions. Yeah. 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 Sure. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Sorry, uh, I didn't need to make it up personal. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. No. I just yeah. want to. It's. I'm just no. clear in case. Uh, no, 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 I got. I understood you know, that. Yeah. Come in. <laughs> uh, um, um, well, we're at the the yeah. hour mark, so we probably should start wrapping up. I'm assuming you probably have things to do, Todd. Uh, 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 tell us, tell us where where people can find you online. I've been flashing things on screen and i will link up things in the show notes but you know some people listen to it as a podcast so so tell us about your podcast so yeah right i have a podcast called why theory i have a i do a youtube channel which is just under my name i think uh and i so that's just has different some videos on hegel some videos on whatever uh the obviously theoretical things not not my true love of sports i don't do any uh, videos on that uh and I, I have, uh, you know, I, my books are on whatever, Amazon or whatever. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or, and my email is, uh, it's like every academic email. I think it's todd.mcgowan at uvm.edu. So that, and people can feel free to email me. I'm happy to, I'm almost happy to get emails from people. Yeah, I, I remember you mentioning on, on your podcast that actually Christian pastors have been emailing you, like looking for yeah. insights from Hegel in, into their faith and what they can bring to their, 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 their con congregations. Yeah, it's been, you know, John, it's been the most amazing thing. So several ministers, I got to know some at Peter Rollins Wake Festival, but the, others not there, others from other things. And and a, a minister, this great guy, David Roberts, he emailed me his the link to his, it's on YouTube even, a sermon where he uh, connects, he thinks of Satan as superego. And I thought, I just thought, wow. It was so, it wasn't my idea at all. He didn't. He's like, okay, maybe inspired in some oblique way from something I wrote. But I just thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. So yeah, there's been, I probably have, I don't know, ten ministers that I'm regularly in communication with. So it's been, I really find that. And then I get this occasionally. They'll some will say like, you should write a book on. Christianity. <laughs> and I, you know, part of me is tempted, but I just, I don't think I know enough. You know, the, like with Hegel, I know all the scholarly, app, like there's a lot of written on Hegel. And with Christianity, obviously, there's even more written. So I would be, <laughs> I would be such a, a quite a lot of that I would not feel comfortable. And about you learned, did you learn German just to read, read I Hegel? Learned, I know I learned German to write a book on Hegel. Oh, okay, so okay. I thought that, I thought that it wouldn't, I wanted to read Hegel in German too, but I thought that if I couldn't, read German and if I didn't know German pretty well I couldn't really write a book on Hegel that would be serious so yeah Did, have you gone back to Freud in the original language after I have read Freud, Freud. I, in fact I'm just teaching a course right now on Sopranos and the Unconscious and I mm. I, I taught Freud and I, I read Freud only in German and let me just say that uh I don't think you even have to know German to understand Freud's German it is so easy it's like yeah. it's like reading <laughs> After you read Hegel and Kant, you go to Freud, you're like, wait a minute, 
Is this the same language? It's like, it's just, it reads like an English. And it's interesting that he did, he was a great English speaker and writer. Yeah. The only thing that he couldn't do is that whenever he'd say, he'd say like the, uh, that chair over there, she want, she's sitting very nicely. You know, like he would yeah. always, he would gender the, the, it, the pro, instead of using it, he would gender the, the, the pronoun. But um, great. And I think my point is, I think he writes German like an English speaker does. So mm. it's so, it's not so, there's long, I mean, Hegel, these long, like Kant too, page long sentences with clauses. And I mean, just not something we do in English. And I think that that's, Freud just doesn't do that either. So just a, and, and, and Freud, Hegel's pretty well translated. Freud is not. So it no. actually helps, I think, a lot to read Freud in the German. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I've always found uh, Freud easy to read, uh, even in English translation. I, I, I like reading him. So, you know, you, you talk a lot about the deaf drive in your work. Is that because your name is Todd? That's a good, you know, I think my parents, like they painted that on my hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. It's funny that my and this is another funny point on that. Whenever Slavoj Zizek quotes me, I for the longest time I used to be just T-O-D. He just would drop the and I said, What are you doing, man? You're just killing me with that. Uh, but yeah, that's, it, it, I don't know, is my parents doing? And they didn't know um, German, so I uh, you might have to explain this joke to me. <laughs> death, oh, so to, Der Tod death. is 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 in German is the name for death. Okay. So T-O-D, but with only one D means death. And so whenever Slavoj dropped the D, he okay. was like, he was killing me, basically. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the, my plugs is, is, of course, for the show, patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can help us out for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. We, we usually do four to six pieces of media. We actually have a new show that we're starting. We can't do it without your support. You know how this works. PayPal.me slash Gnostic. One-time donations. You can also share the show, tell people about the show. Uh, you can find Jason at Jason Memo. Uh, you should check out his theater work at uh, Sage Theater. So, um, hey, hey, Jason, uh, what's the lesson for today's show? Read Todd McGowan. Exactly. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Actually, before we go, before we go, John, sorry, yeah. I did have one, maybe this is like a little coda for the show, yeah. but uh, one of the things you said about belonging there, Todd, that I, I felt like it, it weirdly connects to something I've been saying about, uh, and it, John, this also connects to your point about like, we, live, we say we're secular, but we live in a religious period is that like I, I think a lot about fandom like about how people are so passionate about star wars and that they'll like drive people off of the internet about it and it's the thing that struck me with your statement about uh, belonging is that franchises don't love you back yeah. like uh you know like you can you, you can buy every star wars action figure and at no point will star wars come and say thank you <laughs> you know you, you now fully belong um, yeah. That's just a, uh, and I think there's Great something point. probably true there about about like organized religion and all kinds of things. So yeah, yeah. sorry, I just felt like I wanted. No, to it's a great point. Ahead. It's a good it's ending. Perfect. It's a perfect yeah. coda. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jason. No, it's very good. Okay, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.